All right, so this is the last lecture, continuing on from our reproductive system lecture, sort of putting it all together with development and inheritance. And last time we looked at um, the formation of the gametes, the male and female reproductive systems. And now I want to look at what happens in the process of the fusion of these gametes um, and see what, how it progresses and how it is nourished in, in the uterus. All right, so uh, as we said, the, the chapter is titled Development and Inheritance. Um, development is really just maturation, essentially, right? The process of this gradual, long developmental process that really begins at fertilization and just gradually continues to um, change and divide over many, many years. Um, uh, and so we'll look at that entire process. Inheritance is really the actual process of the genetic material being transferred, uh, the chromosomes uniting um, from generation to generation. So we'll, just, we'll look mostly at development. We won't spend as much time with uh, inheritance. So a um, couple of concepts, differentiation, which is just the you know cell division that occurs after um, um, you know, fertilization occurs, and fertilization is really when development begins, and that's also referred to as conception, and so we'll look at those uh, those processes. And if you recall last time, I said really the first eight weeks after fertilization or conception, it's embryologic development at that point. So the, the, the first two months uh, really are just considered, it's considered an embryo, where after that, uh, the developing uh, structure is now referred to as a fetus, and we call that fetal development and so forth. So embryological development is basically the first eight weeks or two months, and then fetal development is the rest of the way until, uh, until birth. All right? um, and then you also have prenatal and postnatal. postnatal. Prenatal development, which is going to be our focus, is really a combination of both embryological and fetal developmental stages. Postnatal is you know, what happens after birth, of course, and then all of the stages of maturation and development and so growth is completed. Um, and so we'll look briefly at that and sort of get a feel for how that works, but mostly we're going to look at uh, prenatal development uh, in the nine-month gestational period. All right, so we already talked about inheritance and genetics. And so what we want to look at then now is the first concept of fertilization. Fertilization is the fusion of these two gametes, as I was mentioning before. Last time we looked at how they're formed and when they're essentially ready to go and to the point that they're ready to go and, and ultimately uh, fertilization can happen. And now we want to look at that process. And so obviously at this point, you have two gametes, each having 23 chromosomes. And of course, when fertilization occurs, produce what's called a zygote, which is your 46 chromosomes. Um, 23 each from the male and, and 23 from the female. Um, and of course, the spermatozoan delivers the paternal chromosomes um, and fertilizes the, the secondary oocyte. Um, and the sperm has to travel a pretty long distance to do that. Um, and so we'll look at that, look at that process as well. All right, so the female gamos, gamete or oocyte, secondary oocyte, as you know, um, provides a lot more. It, it, number one, the sperm is just providing primarily the male genetic, you know, contribution. Whereas the female, of course, is providing the female chromosomes, but also a whole much other cellular organelles, the inclusions, the potential for nourishment, genetic programming to sort of keep the development of the embryo going till it, till it. Um, uh, is established in the uterus, so there's a lot more going on with the female gametes as opposed to the male, who's really traveling long distance, but just bringing the genetic component. Once that genetic component is delivered, the female gamete or oocyte basically uh, takes care of things from, from there on. All right, so fertilization, as you know, we talked about last time, occurs in the uterus, um, in the uterine tube. Um, basically within that 12 to 24 hour window after ovulation, um, the secondary oocyte does not travel very far, right? Once it's released from the ovary, it's still in that, you know, early components of the uterine, uterine tubes. Um, and the spermatozoa obviously must cover a much further distance 
um, for fertilization to occur. And so capacitation, of course, must occur to the spermatozoan before it has the capability of fertilizing the secondary oocyte. Um, and so, as we know, we talked about last time, the, the secretions from the seminal glands and the other glands, you know, give it the ability to fertilize as well as the conditions in the female reproductive tract allow for capacitation. So if capacitation does not occur, fertilization is not possible. So those accessory components to the sperm are essential for fertilization uh, to take place. All right, so um, <coughs> if we look at um, the sperm, as we know, it has this acrosomal head at the top that has the ability to release these, these essentially enzymes that can sort of erode away and penetrate through the corona radiatum, the zona pellucida, uh, toward the oocyte. Um, and then once we have that occurring, we have oocyte activation, which is fusion of the cell membrane of the sperm and the oocyte. And oocyte then, of course, completes meiosis II. As we know, at that point, prior to that, it's suspended in uh, at meiosis II, and then ultimately can become a mature ovum at once it's uh, fertilized. Okay? Um, so there's a cortical reaction that occurs once fertilization happens that essentially uh, enzymes are released that inactivate sperm receptors, so no other sperm can get in, uh, hardens the zona pellucida, and prevents fertilization by more than one uh, sperm from occurring. So that's, a, of course, an important component that's going to happen. And basically, once fertilization occurs, inside the oocyte, you have the two nuclear components present. You have the female pronucleus and the male pronucleus. And essentially, their genetic material sort of unravels and they come together uh, and migrate uh, to form this fusion of these two uh, nuclear components. And so amplomixis then is a process where you have the fusion of this male and female uh, pronucleus, and that is truly the actual moment of conception. Once the female nucleus and the male nucleus sort of unravel and fuse together, you now have a cell with a zygote with 46 chromosomes, and fertilization is complete. After amphimixis, then we just start to see cell division occurring. Um, the cells divide and divide, and ultimately are going to implant a uterine wall for the next nine months where it can be nourished in the, in, uh, at that location. All right, so um, as I said, the cell divisions then are referred to as cleavage of the cell division, produces daughter cells, and then, then proceed for differentiation to occur um, at that time. And so here's a, a, a nice shot of a secondary oocyte with many sperm, um, and you can see sort of the difference in the size between the oocyte and the sperm trying to penetrate. And again, only one will, will be able to success, successfully do that. And so here's a nice shot of the oocyte at ovulation. You can see the zona pellucida, right, which sort of wraps around the entire um, secondary oocyte. But then, of course, you also have this corona radiata that we talked to, so like the crown that also um, protects, and the sperm basically has to penetrate through these walls and enter in, where you can see the female um, nucleus, pronucleus, and then it will allow for fusion with the male pronucleus. And so, as you can see, you have many sperm trying to penetrate through. Once one sperm breaks through, okay, this barrier is then sort of sealed, uh, as we talked about. The reactions that occur and enzymes are released that basically prevent other sperm from penetrating. So once that one sperm is penetrated, the wall is sort of sealed off, um, and no other sperm are, are essentially capable of getting in. As we said, you have the once fertilization, once the sperm penetrates and moves in, you have these two sets of nuclear material, male and female pronucleus. Um, and essentially, they're going to be drawn to one another. Um, the, the spindle formation and cleavage preparation, basically we start to see these two components essentially forming and coming together. Ultimately, we'll see amphimixis, uh, where the fusion of these two um, genetic components come together. And then finally, um, you have cell division or cleavage, right? That's where we start seeing the first cleavage division. 
um, complete is completed about 30 hours after fertilization. So a day or so after fertilization occurs, we see our first cell division, and we call those blastomeres, right? And then that process will continue. Now I've linked a really nice video here, as you can see, it says fertilization. You need to be you're probably going to have to access this through the actual PowerPoint presentation, um, uh, you know, on Blackboard. Uh, make sure you're watching it in the slideshow. You can't just watch it in, you know, sort of the scroll view when you're initially opening. You have to put it on the slideshow for that link to work. So you want to click on that. It's a video, a really nice video, of it basically explaining the same things that I that I just talked about in terms of the whole process. And so there's some nice images as well. Um, so I would highly recommend watching that to sort of put all these concepts together in uh, fertilization. Okay. Um, all right. So after fertilization, we have induction where we have cells releasing chemical substances that basically trigger this process uh, and cell division to occur. And then the overall nine-month gestation period is the time spent in prenatal development, and so we look at that, and it's considered to be integrated in these three trimesters, right? Each about three months long, that gives you a nine-month uh, component. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the trimester uh, concept, and so we'll look at that. Uh, first trimester is the period of embryologic development in the first two months, but then the, the last month of the first trimester, it, it turns into a fetus at that point. And we start to see the very basic structures of these organ systems beginning to appear. This first trimester is also when pregnancies are the least stable at that time, right? And so those first three months, um, this is the higher incidence of maybe a pregnancy not continuing. Um, but once you get past the first trimester, things sort of settle and get more into a groove with development. Um, and so we see the second and third trimester. The organs begin to develop and organ systems come together, proportions change in the third trimester. We start to see the growth of the fetus and the organ systems by that time are pretty much fully functional and you make it all the way to the nine months of gestation. So first trimester again is, is really sort of the most complex and most essential in these processes and includes four major stages. You have cleavage, implantation, placentation, and embryogenesis. So I'm going to talk about these four different processes uh, in, the, in the first trimester. First is cleavage, and of course cleavage is just the cell division that occurring, right? There are several sets of cell divisions beginning to happen as we talked about. We saw that first one already. And the zygote becomes a pre-embryo, which develops into what's called the blastocyst, and the blastocyst ultimately will contact the uterine wall where it will then be nourished on there for the rest of the um, pregnancy. Uh, after cleavage, we have implantation. As I said, the blastocyst at the end of the cleavage period now becomes attached to the endometrium of the uterus, and this basically sets the stage for the formation of all these really essential embryonic structures like the placenta that is going to be the lifeline to the developing embryo and fetus. Uh, and then ultimately removal of waste products, et cetera. So implantation uh, in the uterus is, is obviously an essential component for this to be a successful uh, pregnancy. After that, we have placentation, which is the formation of the placenta, which is a set of sort of going to be the lifeline for this developing embryo. Uh, and then finally, embryogenesis, where it, once it's, the placenta is formed and it's firmly implanted on the uterine wall, it truly then becomes a viable embryo, and we start to see the initial establishment of all these different organs and organ systems taking place. So those are the really important uh, components of the first trimester. And so as I was saying, first trimester is really the most dangerous period of prenatal life. Forty percent of conceptions um, produce embryos that passed that survived past the first trimester, right? So not all of them are making it, certainly, not, not by a long shot. Um, and so this, is, again, is where you had your highest incidence of what they call miscarriages, of course, when a pregnancy is not viable. Um, so that is the first trimester. Um, this cleavage and blastocyst formation during this first trimester, again, we have these things called blastomeres, which are identical cells, which basically we just see this series of cleavage of cell divisions. Um, and after about stage three or three days of this cleavage 
um, cycle, we have this pre-embryo that we call in marula, um, and that reaches the uterus typically on about day four. Uh, and then these blastomeres also ultimately form what's called a blastocyst, as we were mentioning before. Um, and that blastocyst is ultimately where we're going to see um, development into uh, an embryo. All right, so trophoblast is the next stage um, of cellular division. Um, and the cells then basically are pro ultimately going to provide nutrients from the trophoblast, ultimately provide nutrients to the developing embryo. Um, after cell division begins to occur, we start to see the formation of the inner cell mass. And this inner cell mass is ultimately was later going to start to form uh, the embryo. And so this, these slides really sort of summarize a little bit better in terms of what's happening from day zero all the way through implantation. And so you can see initially, of course, we have ovulation, which is the release of the secondary oocyte. Within you know the first 12 to 24 hours, we can see the sperm fertilizing, and so we call that day zero. Right? It doesn't begin until actual fertilization occurs, and then we start to see this progression of cell divisions, right? Two, four, six, so forth. And so we have first cle cell cleavage division begins, as we talked about previously. So you have these blastomeres, which are these two cell stage and then four cell stage. Day three and day four, you have this early and advanced marula. And then finally, day six, you have this um, you know, really important blastocyst, as it's referred to. And we start to see this inner cell mass forming. So the trophoblast, as we said, is ultimately what's going to allow it to um, implant on the wall and ultimately form the, the lifeline to the embryo. And the inner cell mass is ultimately going to be the, the forming uh, embryo. And so you can sort of see that occurring. And then you can see typically about 10 to 7 days is when we'll see implantation in the uterine wall. And it completely becomes really absorbed by the uterine wall. And we'll look at those processes here uh, in a little bit. So as I said, implantation then is the next step. The blastocyst adheres to the uterine lining. And that trophoblast, that outer portion, starts to develop, divide rapidly. And you see the several layers forming uh, inside the, the uterine wall. Um, the cellular trophoblast, again, uh, is the cell closest to the blastocyst. The syncytial trophoblast is the outer layer, and this is what sort of erodes a path in this uterine wall uh, by secreting um, basically an enzyme that's going to break down these uh, components of the, of the you know, endometrial lining called hyaluronidase. Okay? Um, and so that's implantation. And so you can see this happening. It's another nice picture around day six, day seven. You can see the functional zone of the endometrium. You have the blastocyst. And now at this point, it's, uh, uh, you can see the inner cell mass and the trophoblast. And you have these two layers of the trophoblast. Um, you have the cellular trophoblast. Um, and you start to see the formation and sort of the erosion of that uh, endometrial wall. Um, in that functional zone. So there are pregnancies that implantation occurs outside of the uterus, unfortunately. We call that an ectopic pre pregnancy. Um, this does not produce a viable embryo and actually can be dangerous to the mother. So it's essential that obviously it forms, the implantation occurs in the uterus because that's how we're going to get placental formation, as we're going to see here in a minute, uh, which is ultimately going to allow the um, developing embryo and fetus to survive for nine months until birth. Um, all right, so a um, couple other components. As we start to see the formation of the trophoblast into the endometrium, we start to see this amniotic cavity. And the amniotic cavity is just a fluid-filled chamber. Chamber. Uh, this fluid-filled chamber contains amniotic fluid, of course. And ultimately, you probably all heard the term uh, when a woman's water breaks during pregnancy. That's what we're talking about, this fluid-filled amniotic cavity. That's the fluid, the amniotic fluid, that helps protect and support the developing fetus. Uh, as it gets larger and larger, we'll see sort of breaks, and that fluid is released. And that's sort of the first step when you start to see um, you know, labor and delivery begin. Okay? And so here you can see, um, really, the, 
by day 10, you see it completely consumed. You have these two layers of the trophoblast starting to form. You can see the amniotic cavity here um, uh, being formed as well as, as these by day 10. Uh, there are extra embryonic membranes that are formed um, to support embryonic and then ultimately field development. Um, you can see these different components. We talked about the amniotic fluid a little bit. And I think that should be good if you, if you uh, look at those things. Don't worry so much about the yolk sac. Um, we talked about the amnion a little bit. Um, you can review that a little bit. But these components don't worry about as much. Um, and so what you can see what happens in by week two, we really start to see the formation of uh, the amnionic uh, cavity, and then we start to see this, this cellular component begin to form. And ultimately, amniotic cavity containing the amniotic fluid, we're seeing the very, very early stages of the development of the embryo. And you can see the head fold and the spinal cord essentially in the very early stages uh, beginning to form around um, week three. Okay? And you can also see the placenta beginning to form here on that outer layer of the trophoblastic. Uh, component. By week four, um, we start to see a tail fold. You can see the head fold again, and ultimately the sort of the spinal cord being being forming. Uh, and then you can again, you can see the fluid is all consumed in this region. Um, by week four, by week five, things start to develop a little bit further, and you can see really enlargement of the uterus and how it's the complete inner layer is really developed and you can see how far the um, uh, developing embryo is moving out into the lumen of the uterus um, and we'll continue to do that through those processes. Fast forward to about 10 weeks, you can see the amnion uh, fluid which the em embryo and fetus is going to survive in uh, getting larger. You can see the placenta formation, uh, how it's going to you know, allow for um, nutrient transfer of nutrients and antibodies and other components, waste products, um, is, is essential to that formation. Placentation is the next component. We start to see this connection between the, the, the embryo um, and the, the chorion uh, as we start to see this formation. Again, we'll see several components of the placentation formation. Um, don't need to go into all these these details, but ultimately you know that it's going to be called the umbilical cord, which is going to link the fetus and the placenta, uh, and the placenta circulation, of course, is going to pass through the vascularity that's found in those locations. And then, so ultimately, you have this um, development in developing um, embryo, getting close to uh, fetal stage by the end of this. Uh, component. And there are some, some images of the blood vessels that are being exchanged uh, at that location. Um, so, the, by the, towards the end of the first trimester, we have this, the placenta, which can re release several hormones um, that are released into the maternal bloodstream. Uh, several of them are going to help this process along. Progesterone and estrogens, we're going to look at relaxin, placental pro prolactin, HCG, and HPL are all things that are released into the maternal bloodstream at this time. So we want to look at these few of these components. The first one is a hormone that's released called HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin, and this appears in the maternal bloodstream soon after implantation. So once the the developing um, pre-embryo has implanted into uh, the uterine wall. We start to see this HCG that's released in the bloodstream. And this is a very reliable indication of pregnancy, right? Because this shows this hormone is only going to be released one hit, once it has been implanted into the uterine wall. Um, if there's no HCG, pregnancy is not going to happen. Okay? And so this is a very reliable indicator of pregnancy. And this is what women use when they're trying to do uh, those pregnancy tests, right? They can uh, this is be in the blood and in the urine. And so if it's a positive test, this will be on the, on the, um, in the urine. And that's a nice indicator of uh, pregnancy. All right. Um, 
HPL, or human placental lactogen, um, prepares the mammary glands for milk production. So this is also going to work with growth hormone or other tissues and make sure adequate sugar and proteins and other things are available uh, for the developing fetus. Um, pro placental prolactin helps convert the mammary glands into active status. Relaxin is another really important hormone uh, secreted by the placenta and the corpus luteum during um, pregnancy. Relaxin, as the term indicates, helps increase flexibility, like for instance at the pubic synthesis. You guys recall the pubic synthesis during uh, AMP1 we talked about there's a fibrocartilage pad where these two pubic bones come together. Obviously that's going to need to expand and change during delivery. Um, and so it relaxes these joints. It's also known to have an impact on other joints, not just the pubic synthesis. So generally speaking, this hormone acts at articulation, make them a little more lax and about, allow for change in expansion of the pelvis during delivery. Um, also dilation of the cervix, which is also we'll talk about during delivery, is, is an essential component. And suppresses the release of oxytocin, which is really important because oxytocin if you recall from AMP1, is going to be the primary driver of uterine wall contraction, which is labor. And so obviously that's one of the things you need to suppress. Oxytocin relaxin is going to do that. Progesterone is the other thing, um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so embryogenesis then, we start to see the embryo begin to ultimately form this head and tail fold, and we'll start to see organ genesis or organogenesis form where these organs are forming, and ultimately it's going to begin to turn into uh, a fetus. And so at week two, you can see the future head and spinal cord, ultimately where these components will be uh, in development. Week four, again, you can see our really early stages. You can see the tail, and you can see the spinal cord and the head starting to form. You can see the eye uh, and the ear. So you're starting to see other components of the body really sort of come together. You can see the heart starting to form. So it's a pretty neat uh, uh, view of, of development at uh, about uh, four weeks. Okay. Um, after that, around week eight, we start to see development continue even further. We can see the embryo and the head and the eyes. You can see the placenta. Um, over here you can see the umbilical cord linking to the placenta, of course. Um, you can see the amniotic cavity containing the fluid. Um, and so that's about week eight of development. Uh, week 12, same thing. We start to see the fingers and legs. Um, you can see the umbilical cord, of course, going out to the placenta. You can see some of the sutures that are going to form in the skull, ultimately. And this slide just sort of shows what's happening at each of the stages with all the different organ systems. So you don't have to memorize this section for section, but it would be nice to review to sort of see when these things are starting to form and at what stage uh, in the gestational process. All right, so make sure you review those. All right, so that's the end of the first trimester, right? The first three months. After that, if, if the pregnancy continues past the stage, usually things are in pretty good shape in terms of having a higher success rate of pregnancies going full term. Second trimester, we start to see the fetus growing really rapidly, and it's now it's going to take over and be much larger than the placenta in third trimester. Growth rate slows a little bit, and we just see more weight gain, right? And so it's pre getting prepared to be um, um, delivered at that time. And so here you can see a four-month-old fetus, uh, fetus through a, a endoscope. Uh, there's another uh, ultrasound image that I'm sure most of you have seen, at least by a, you know a friend or someone like that. It's a pretty common imaging tool uh, to check pregnancy. You can check sex as well with with ultrasound. Uh, imaging. And so pregnancy at 16 weeks, right, you can still see uh, the placenta and you can see the uterus and the amniotic cavity. Uterus is still, you know, not that big by 16 weeks because we're going to see in these last two trimesters this is going to change uh, rapidly. Okay, and so as you see, the, we start to see the development getting further and further. And we have some nice images here so you can see what's happening to the uterus at full term. Look how big the uterus is now. About 
40 times as big as the size it was in that previous image. All right. So big change there. Big change in the uterus. You can see the placenta, how nice and uh, vascularized and healthy that looks. And of course, you have the umbilical cord. And this is full term. And you can also see how displaced all the other organs are. Right. You can see all of the digestive and small intestine. You can see the pancreas. Um, you can see the aorta, the liver, but then look at the urinary bladder, right? Sitting right below all that weight pushing directly down the urinary bladder. You can see why a woman probably has to urinate quite a bit um, when um, she is pregnant, and especially in that third trimester, right? All that weight pushing directly down uh, on, the, on the urinary bladder. So anyway, this is a really nice sort of cross-section of pregnancy um, at full term. And so this is a sectional view versus a non-pregnant woman. Again, look at the size of the uterus compared with the previous slide. Huge difference. All right. All right. So um, during the second and third trimesters, we see the the fetus is you know of course completely dependent on the mother. Right. The maternal organs for nourishment, respiration, waste removal, and so. In response to that, of course, we see a lot of maternal adaptations, right? We see respiratory rate and tidal volume go up, right? Because blood volume is going up. It requires to have more blood volume to give oxygen to the developing fetus. Nutrient and vitamin intake, of course, has to go up. Glomerular filtration rate, GFR. Remember we talked about GFR in the kidneys? Obviously, that's going to go up because it's clearing more waste products. So it's just producing more urine uh, to to clear more waste products. And of course, we talked about the size of the uterus and mammary glands also changing during these second and third trimesters. As I said, another really important hormone is progesterone. Okay, progesterone. Pro in favor of just gestation, right? So progesterone is released by the placenta and has an inhibitory effect on the smooth muscle of the uterus, right? And that prevents the, the uterine wall from contracting. Remember, we just saw how large the uterus gets. It has such a large increase in size, you can imagine all that stretching and distension. That uterus wants to contract, but we don't want it to contract, right? It needs to last these nine months. And so progesterone is released by the placenta to limit contraction um, and ultimately allow this pregnancy or gestational period to go full term through, through those three trimesters. And so Opposition to progesterone ultimately will begin to happen when estrogen level goes up, oxytocin level goes up, and prostaglandin production goes up. Okay, these things are going to oppose progesterone, and ultimately you're going to start to see labor and delivery. And so that's what we want to look at at the end of the third trimester. We start to see structural and functional changes to the uterus. False labor would be where you have inconsistent or non pattern oriented or not regular or persistent contractions or spasms in the uterine musculature. That's false labor. True labor is when we start to see this positive feedback loop. Remember we talked about way back in ANP1, positive feedback loop is where whatever is happening, the changes are enhanced and it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And so you have this biochemical and mechanical sort of feedback system that produces these labor contractions that begin in the myometrium and continue until uh, birth occurs. Okay, and so that's what um, sort of drives this whole process. And so this is a nice chart overlooking the whole process. Placental factors initially, right? The, the placental estrogens are going to increase. The relaxin uh, produced by the placenta relaxes the articulations and dilate the cervix. The fetal factors, right, as the fetus gets larger and larger, all these things are going to lead to distortion of the myometrium. Distortion of the myometrium is going to want the smooth muscle to contract. Oxytocin release, of course, is going to increase from the anterior lobe, or excuse me, posterior lobe of the pituitary. That's going to drive further contractions, increased excitability of the myometrium, and then ultimately that's going to lead to labor contractions. So this is a nice chart to look at how uh, labor and delivery is essentially initiated, right? You have several things sort of working together uh, in this overall process. And so ultimately, the contractions of the uterus are leading to what we call parturition or forcible expulsion of the fetus, typically through the vaginal wall or the vaginal pathway of the birth canal, um, and ultimately the result of these contractions. And so typically, the contractions 
begin near the top of the uterus and sweep in a wave down towards the cervix, right? And they, they're strong and occur in these regular patterns and they increase, right? Not only do they become more powerful, but they come closer together, right? And so it moves it towards the cervical canal. Um, so ultimately delivery can happen. And during labor, you have three stages. You have dilation, expulsion, and then finally um, the placental stage. The dilation stage is really what begins with the onset of true labor. Once these contractions start to happen in a consistent pattern, um, hopefully the, the fetus or is in the correct position, the head moving towards the cervix, and that pressure uh, of those contractions cause the cervix to even dilate even further, right? So there are hormones and relaxants going to help dilate the cervix, but that pressure also dilates. And dilates mean making that opening in the cervix even larger. And so the fetus begins to shift towards that cervix cervical canal, and this is where they say this is the segment, the dilation of stage is typically what lasts the longest, right? It, this is when you hear someone says, oh, I was in labor for 15 hours, right? This is the stage you're talking about when they're referring to that, because it can be a highly variable length, and they take much longer for this dilation to occur, and if the cervix does not dilate, can you see how there's no way the baby is going to pass through, okay? And so this takes a while, can last over eight hours. But typically, as a result of the contractions, they increase. We'll see the, the water breaking, as I was talking about before, the amniotic uh, membrane ruptures, and the amniotic fluid is released, and that will think, speed things up in terms of progression. And so here's a nice image sort of showing the different stages. This You can see the cervix right here. It's not dilated or effaced at that time. Um, effacement, you can see it's sort of stretching out. The cervix is about 50% effaced at that point. Cervix is 100% effaced, meaning it's ready to, uh, close to being able to see through the cervix opening and then dilated. Typically, it's about 10 centimeters. It's typically when you see the cervix being fully dilated, and you can see that opening right there. And typically, a labor and delivery nurse has the ability to then sort of palpate for that and feel and measure how far along the dilation has occurred. And then once you're at 10 centimeters, then usually you're pretty much ready to go. At that point, the nurse would call the physician, the physician would come in if you're close or in that range of that level of dilation. Because again, this whole process can take many, many hours. So typically the, the OB physician is not going to sit there during the whole stages of that process and wants to come in right when things are ready to go. And, actions ready to happen. All right? All right, so you can see you have the fully developed fetus right ready for delivery to begin, right? The head is in the right position. You can see the cervix and the cervical canal uh, and then moving down towards vaginal delivery. Uh, dilation, we just talked about the dilation stage. That's the first stage. Uh, expulsion stage is next. After the cervix completely dilates, the contractions are going to be reaching maximum intensity and will continue until the fetus has emerged from the vagina. This is much faster, typically less than just an hour or so or maybe even shorter, and that leads to delivery, which is the uh, arrival of the newborn uh, into the outside world. Um, Episiotomy may be needed, which is an incision actually through the perineal musculature, uh, which if the vaginal canal is not large enough for the fetus to pass through. This will allow for ease of um, delivery to occur, uh, but then can be repaired with sutures almost immediately after uh, delivery. Uh, there are alternate, right? Vaginal delivery is not the only method, right? Uh, there are C-section, of course, as I'm sure most of you know. Caesarean section is removal of the infant uh, through an opening or incision that's created in the abdominal wall. So instead of having a vaginal delivery, just pull it out through the abdominal wall. Um, opens the uterus just enough to pass the infant's head. And oftentimes this is needed if you have complications or if delivery is not going well, you're having dilation issues. But now it seems that some people can just schedule C-sections um, with, you know, as sort of a normal delivery process. So um, there's quite a discussion about this. Um, we're learning that the microbiome 
that a vaginal delivery baby gets versus what a cesarean injection baby gets are completely different. What impact does that have long term? Not really sure of that at this time. Uh, so anyway, sort of an interesting topic, but C-section fortunately is there in case um, you know complications arise. And so then we have the expulsion stage. Uh, and then finally, the, the placental stage, uh, muscle tension will build in the uterine wall um, and ultimately release and deliver the placenta as well. We call that afterbirth, and that's also accompanied by uh, blood loss. And so the rejection of the placenta, the uterus, as you see, is going to continue to contract to try to return back to uh, a more, uh, you know, size that was typical before um, pregnancy. Premature labor, unfortunately, can occur when true labor begins before the nine months or normal development has completed. And again, the earlier the delivery, the, the more challenges you're going to see. But fortunately, with modern medicine and science, um, we've made incredible gains on preemie babies in terms of living a normal life after birth. Um, but again, the earlier you go, and the survival rates are directly related to body weight at delivery. So the less weight you have, the less chance you have survival. But again, there are technologies and other things that we can do with medicine nowadays that uh, allow these preemies to survive and, and live normal lives, whereas previously, 30 years or 40 years ago, or so they may not have survived. Uh, so an immature delivery is fetus born 25 to 27 weeks of, of gestation. So you can see that's really early. Most do not survive that. Uh, if they do, they have a high risk of developmental abnormalities. Premature delivery, which I was referring to more, is birth really once you make it to about 28 weeks. Any, anything after 28 to 36 weeks um, is premature. And then after that, of course, is in the normal range. Um, so new, new ones, though, and premature now have a good chance of surviving and uh, developing uh, normally. There are difficult deliveries, um, forceps deliveries, if, uh, you know, again, the fetus faces the mother pubis instead of the sacrum, it may be harder for the um, delivery to occur, so forceps can help sort of grasp the head of the fetus and pull them out that way. Unfortunately, that could be potential for injury uh, uh, from that standpoint. Uh, breech birth is really the opposite direction, right? When the legs and buttocks enter the fetus and vaginal canal first, uh, instead of the head, the umbilical cord could become constricted. So there are many things with the feet going first. The cervix may not dilate properly. Uh, so this could be very stressful. Uh, breech birth, not always very smooth. So the head, head first birth, obviously, uh, is the preferred method. Now, there also are multiple births, of course, different types of twins. We have diazygotic twins, which are also referred to as fraternal twins, are developed when you have two separate oocytes were ovulated and two were fertilized. So the genetic makeup is not identical, right? Because you have two separate oocytes that have that were released at ovulation and subsequently fertilized. And so most twins are like this, where they're not identical twins, right? They're they're the siblings, of course, but they're not, they don't have the, the exact same genetic makeup. And so 70% of the twins are dizygotic or fraternal twins. Um, but there's also monozygotic twins, of course, which are identical twins. They result typically from separation of the blastomeres early in um, cleavage or splitting of that inner cell mass. Remember that inner cell mass is where the embryo divides. And since it was just came from one gamete, right, the genetic, genetic makeup is identical. There are two separate uh, individuals forming, though. Um, and so those are, of course, identical twins. So um, finally, postnatally, life stages. We'll just wrap up with a few things here real quick. Um, neonatal infancy, childhood, adolescence, maturity, of course. Um, these periods, I think you can read through this. I think you pretty much can make sense of that. Infancy is the first month to about two years. Childhood is two years until adolescence. Adolescence is where we have sexual and physical maturation. And then really after that, we're unfortunately we refer to it as senescence, which is really the process of aging, which begins after development is complete. Um, 
during the neonatal period, right, two major events occur. The organ systems become fully operational and the individual grows rapidly, right? During that period, you can see significant changes occurring and pediatricians or pediatrics of a medical specialty that focus on from post -develop, postnatal development all the way through infancy and adolescence uh, in terms of helping and monitoring those and treating those um, uh, children. So, um, neonates then are the newborns transitioning from the fetus to the neonate, and we start to see the respiratory, circulatory, digestive, urinary functions all beginning to form. Um, another thing we want to talk about with postnatal life is lactation of the mammary glands. And the first thing you have is what's called colostrum. And this is the initial secretion from the mammary glands during the first few days after birth. Uh, this contains more proteins and antibodies than it does with fat that we typically see in, in um, breast milk. Um, and so as the colostrum, the initial delivery sort of drops off, then we start to see the more typical milk production that occurs. Breast, breast milk consists of water and proteins, fat, content, sugars, salts, um, you know, so a lot of components also contain enzymes, antibiotic enzymes, so you get a lot of health properties. Um, in breast milk um, and how it's released. We talked a little bit about this in AMP1. We call it the milk letdown reflex where the mammary gland uh, is triggered when the infant is nursing, right? And so that typically can happen um, until weaning could be, you know, a couple months, could be six months, could be a year, two years. I guess it just really depends on the individual and how long they're interested in in, in nursing um, the developing uh, infant. So uh, how this works, again, it's a reflex process, right? You have stimulation of the tactile receptors in the nipple, which send a direct message up to the posterior lobe of the pituitary, if you call, recall. The posterior lobe of the pituitary causes direct release of oxytocin. Oxytocin from the posterior lobe of the pituitary via the hypothalamus travels down and causes the milk to then be released or ejected. Okay, so make sure you look at that and review that process. Um, postnatal life continues, of course, infancy and childhood. Uh, we have hormones like thyroid hormones and growth hormones um, that help growth occur and body proportions change over these periods of time. And sort of look at the process from prenatal through fetal development all the way to neonates, infancy, childhood, and maturity. You can see that. So adolescence and maturity. Puberty, of course, is the period of sexual maturation um, and begins adolescence, typically about 12 in boys, 11 in girls, something like that, um, is when we start to see this happening. And we see three major hormonal events occurring. Um, hypothalamus increases production of GnRH. GnRH, of course, causes FSH and LH levels to increase. This stimulates the ovaries and testes to become and more sensitive and produce more hormones. And we start to see more estrogen and testosterone and other hormones being released as a result of that uh, development. And it's going to impact many systems in their progression. So adolescence begins at puberty and continues until growth uh, occurs. Of course, maturity is senescence, as we described, which is really the aging process. It's hard to think of the aging process really beginning when we're like, you know, in our 20s, but it kind of does. You know, after 30, we talked about neuronal changes that can, can occur and decline that happens in our 30s. And ultimately, sex hormone levels will continue to decline, ultimately, uh, at menopause for women. Uh, men will continue to produce testosterone, but it will decline significantly as well over the years. And then geriatrics, of course, is a medical specialty dealing with aging, right? Helping individuals who are aging um, and, and managing that. So anyway, that sort of wraps it up for the lecture um, for this uh, development, sort of puts it together with the reproductive system. So all right.